So welcome to my talk. Uh, I'll tell you about this uh, new paper we have. It's on online already on ECCC since a few days ago. So it's joined with a bunch of people from all over the place. I think Robert Robert is interesting because he'll be at IAS next spring. So this paper, it's basically a follow-up work to two stock papers from this summer. Uh, so these stock papers, they introduced a new connection between monotone circuit complexity and proof complexity. So I'll, I'll get to this connection in the end, but we'll just start with the very basics. So here we study the complexity of monotone Boolean functions. So it's a function from n bits to single bit. And we say it's monotone if for any input pair n bit strings that are ordered in this way, meaning coordinate wise, so every bit of x is at most the corresponding bit of y, then we require that the output of the function is similarly ordered. So that's what it means to be monotone. And monotone functions are precisely those that are computed by monotone circuits. So circuits with only AND and OR gates. There are no negations here. So maybe a canonical example is the k-click function. It takes as input the adjacency matrix of a graph and outputs one if the graph contains a k-click. So that's monotone. If you add edges to a graph, you're only more likely to contain a k-click. It's also an NP-hard problem. And studying the monotone circuit complexity of monotone functions was all the rage in the 80s. Uh, I think a, a very famous result was that the k-click function requires, um, well, Raspberry Pi requires super polynomial size monotone circuits. So that's kind of separating P and NP in the world of monotone computations. And the lower bounds were subse subsequently made even exponential. And as I understand it, uh, at the time, people were kind of excited like you, to, to separate P from NP in the non-monotone general world. All you need to do is to kind of handle negation. So how high can that be? But uh, maybe now we're less optimistic. Uh, although, you know, people are still trying to modify these age-old proofs to separate uh, P versus NP. I think there was an attempt last year. Well, I'm not going to be that ambitious. So I study these things because well, there's the in intrinsic motivation. So they are amongst the strongest models of computation for which we can show unconditional lower bounds. And I also have the usual mathematician's excuse that these things are beautiful. So especially because it's connected to so many other areas in uh, theoretical computer science that are seemingly disparate. So I'll talk extensively, extensively about how you can view monotone computations in the language of communication complexity. That was the topic of my thesis, so I, I really like this. There are connections to proof complexity. I briefly mentioned there are new connections, but there are old ones from the 90s, something called monotone feasible interpolation. So it's a, it's a technique that allows you to derive from lower bounds on monotone circuits, lower bounds in propositional proof complexity. You know, for example, um, this technique still gives the best lower bounds we have for cutting planes. It's the only method, as far as I know, to, to prove uh, lower bounds for cutting planes. It's a uh, semi-powerful proof system. And there are other connections to things like uh, linear or semi-definite extension complexity and cryptography. So in this new paper, I'm just going to hit you with the main result of the paper, or at least a prototypical one, which is that we can show an exponential monotone circuit lower bound for some monotone version of the XOR SAT function. So I, I need to be careful firstly, like how do I define XOR SAT as a monotone function? So here's how we do it, it's a kind of a, a clever definition. So this is a function with underlying n variables in the XOR SAT instance. Just imagine a list of all possible ternary XOR constraints over n variables. So there are roughly n cubed of them. For any triple of variables, I can say that their parity should equal 1 or it should equal 0. It's a list of all of them. So the input to the XOR fac uh, SAT function is simply a subset of these constraints as indicated by a, an input vector. So the input vector is, is an indicator function or a vector for a set. It defines a set of constraints. And then we can ask, is this set of constraints satisfiable? I say that the XOR set evaluates to true if it's unsatisfiable. So I need to say unsatisfiable in order to make the function monotone. 
I want it to be the case that if I flip an input from 0 to 1, so that means I'm adding a constraint to my instance, um, that's, that's only going to make the instance more difficult to satisfy. So it's just a, more deta a small detail to call the yes inputs the unsatisfiable uh, systems. So for this function, we can prove an exponential lower bound. And it's interesting because, well, XORSAT is such a simple function in the non-monotone world. And, you know, you can solve it using Gaussian elimination. And this is kind of saying you can't um, simulate Gaussian elimination with monotone circuits efficiently. Um, in fact, um, this, uh, the XORSAT function is even NC2. So there's an efficient parallel algorithms for it. So it witnesses this huge monotone versus non-monotone separation. I think the only previous function uh, for a monotone versus non-monotone separation was some function that Tardosh defined out of the Lovash theta function for graphs. So to compute Lovash's theta function, you have to solve a semi-definite program. So the best upper bound we can give a Tardosh function is that it's in P. So our new function, it's a lot easier in the non-monotone world. I should also mention this uh, perfect matching function, which is kind of famous. Uh, it's conjecture that it has exponential size monotone circuit complexity, but so far Rasper have uh, sol only proved a quasi-polynomial lower bound. So that's actually one of my favorite problems is to try to show a better lower bounds for matching. But even if, if it had exponential com complexity, the best upper bound we can give it, I'm really milking the result here, it's just randomized NC, not deterministic NC2. <laughs> So I hope the main result is solved. It, it's kind of a prototypical result. We have this machinery where you can prove lower bounds, not just for a function like this, but over any field. If you think of these as equations over GF2, actually we can prove lower bounds over any field. So I'll tell you about how something like this is proved. <laughs> and this project, it started roughly a year ago. So one of my co-authors told me about a wonderful characterization of circuit or, or monotone circuit size in the language of communication complexity. And surprisingly, I hadn't heard about this. It's due to Rasparov from the 90s. And it's kind of surprising because everybody, well, we are new students in the audience, but there's a famous characterization of formula size due to Kochman or Victorson. That's kind of a standard knowledge, but I had somehow missed that there's a, a similar one for circuits. And that kind of prompted um, uh, developing these uh, this new framework of, of proving monotone circuit lower bounds. So I'll spend some time explaining these classical results. They're really, really nice. I, I like them conceptually. So I would still maybe hype this up in that you know, seeing this characterization, it kind of immediately suggested um, a type of a theorem to prove. It's a kind of a conceptual breakthrough, just seeing, seeing these alternative characterizations. So let me start with explaining this Karchman Victorson connection. I mean, I'm doing it knowing that there are many new students here. And when I was starting out as a first year grad student, so I took a class on communication complexity and I learned of this for the first time. And it just blew my mind. Now I have high standards for my mind blowing. It only happened a couple of times and this is one of them. Um, uh, so I remember reading, so this is to Karchman Victorson. This was part of Karchman's thesis and it at the time won the uh, doctoral dissertation award from ACM. So what's so mind-blowing about it is it gives you a new view of computation. Typically, you think of computation as bottom-up, don't you? You have your input bits, and you start combining them with logical gate to build up complexity until at the very top you've computed your function, bottom-up. But this uh, kochman victorson characterization gives a top-down interpretation of computation. <coughs> And the way it does it is this, you, you define, you fi fixed your favorite monotone function. Well, you can do this for any function in the non-monotone case, then you would be characterizing a general formula size or, or which is equivalent to, um, well, circuit depth is equivalent to log formula size. But well, just considering the monotone case here. So you fix your favorite function and you consider the following communication game between two players, Alice and Bob. So Alice is given uh, a yes input of the function, and Bob is given a no input of the function. So these are two strings, so they're different, they value to different values, so they must differ somewhere. And if you think about it for a bit, if these instances come from a 
monotone function, they must also differ positively somewhere. There must be a coordinate where Alice has a 1, Bob has a 0. So this communication search problem is, on these inputs, find a coordinate with the least amount of communication between the players. So what Karchman and Wittgen showed is that the deterministic communication complexity of this game exactly captures the monotone circuit depth, the least depth of a monotone circuit that computes the function. And so what's so amazing about this is that the proof is really simple and the proof reveals this top-down view of circuits. So I'm going to prove one direction of this for illustration. It's like, I guess, the easier direction. So why is it the case that from a monotone circuit I can extract a protocol solving this search problem? So here's a circuit and I want to define a protocol. Okay. What should I press? I press the wrong button. Go to view and go to full screen. Enter full screen at the bottom. Okay, so here's the protocol. You traverse the circuit top down. You start at the very top. So we know that the top gate computes the function. So by assumption, Alice and Bob are given you know, yes and no input. So it means that the top gate witnesses a positive difference in the input. So the gate, top gate, evaluates different values on Alice's input and Bob's input. So you kind of start with such an invariant holding. And the idea is you traverse the circuit down while trying to remain, uh, retain this invariant. So again, so if I have such a positive difference at the top, it must be the case that one of its children also has such a positive difference. I mean, how can the top gate evaluate two different values in the world if the, in the two different worlds you're not fed different values to the gate? So it must be the case that one of these guys also has such a difference. And figuring out which child has the property, it takes us constantly many bits. So Alice knows this value, Bob knows this value. They can exchange this information and figure out. Yeah, if you optimize this, you can do it with one bit. So it actually... Because you know that the, ones, that the one player has two ones there. Right, so it's, um, it's only one of the players, depending whether it's an AND or an OR gate, can just send one bit to indicate how to descend down. So let's say, one, you can do this with one bit to figure out how to retain the invariant. And you continue doing this. Every t time you step downwards, you communicate one bit until you end up at a leaf. And now you have a variable that has the invariant, meaning that variable evaluates to two different values positively. That's <coughs> exactly a solution to the karchman vickerson problem. So, I mean, this is kind of amazing. Like, you walk here today, you thought computation is, of course, bottom. But this is, is a completely different way of viewing it. And it's useful for proving lower bounds because it gives you new types of intuitions. Like, proving lo a communication lower bounds for search problems like this gives you um, monotone circuit lower bounds. OK, so that's you know, re really classic stuff. And then Rasparov came up with a circuit analog of this. And this is... To me, it was new. <laughs> it's kind of buried in the literature and it's not advertised a lot. It's also um, somewhat more complicated. And I'm going to use the original terminology that Rasparov used. So he defined a notion of a communication analog of this classical notion of PLS. So PLS for polynomial local search. It's one of these Turing machine search problem classes, uh, subclass of TFNP, the class of total NP search problems. So if you have seen that, that's fine, but I'm going to give you here a communication analog of this, this classical notion. And so there is a type of protocol I can define for a two-party search problem. We're going to be a bit general. We're going to apply this to monotone cosmic vectors and games, but for now, let's just fix any two-party search problem, meaning Alice gets an input from X, Bob gets an input from Y, and they need to somehow find an output symbol so that they're in the relation defined by S. So S is just an arbitrary search problem. So there's a sense in which we can, we can solve such a search problem by uh, a PLS protocol. So classically, PLS is the class of problems whose totality is guaranteed by this principle that every DAG has a sink. So in the Turing machine case, you have an implicitly defined graph. So you have a small circuit that you can ask uh, 
names of nodes and the uh, circuit outputs you descriptions of the neighborhood at, of that node in a graph. And we impose restrictions that the implicitly defined graph will be a DAG, so it must have sinks, and the sinks will be associated with the solutions. So I'm going to go through this again in the language of communication complexity. I'm going to let protocols implicitly describe a DAG. So the protocol is given by, first you fix some set of nodes, and so here are a bunch of nodes, and for each node you associate a candidate solution. I haven't drawn it in this picture, but, but each node comes with a candidate solution. And also a deterministic communication protocol, which takes inputs X and Y, the inputs that Alice and Bob are given. And based on the input, they describe this local neighborhood of the node. They output a candidate successor node. So each node has a candidate successor and also an integer label, which we call the potential of the node. And these two pieces of data, they implicitly describe this graph, where we put an edge between two different nodes. So again, it's a graph that's a function of the input to the search problem. So once you've fixed an input to the search problem, you can run this protocol on all of the nodes and get these two pieces of information attached to each node. And then you can define this graph, kind of, in your mind virtually, where I add an edge from u to v. Well, if u thinks that its successor is v, that's one condition, but also you need to require that the associated potential decreases along the edge. So the function of the potential is simply to enforce that the, uh, the graph that is described is a DAG. If the potential decreases every time I take a step, I can't have cycles in my graph. So that's a syntactic way of uh, ensuring that we have a DAG. So that means that there must be sinks in the, uh, in the implicitly defined graph. And the correctness of such a protocol is simply that if on a fixed input x and y you become a sink, then the associated solution needs to be feasible for the input. So that's the whole definition. Okay, it's slightly more complicated than just deterministic protocols. But given a search problem, you can ask, what's the most concise PLS protocol that solves that problem? Um, conciseness is just measured, the cost of a protocol is measured as, let's say, the log of the number of nodes you're using, plus the maximum communication cost of the protocol. So this is my notation for how many bits in the worst case the protocol communicates. So I just maximize over all nodes. So. Any, any questions about this definition? I'm going to illustrate a little bit uh, next, but... The protocols anything? are nodes? Yeah, with each node comes a protocol. Okay, so what Rothbard showed is, again, in the monotone case, it's a general case, but in the monotone case, you can capture the log of monotone circuit size as the least cost of a PLS protocol that uh, solves the monotone cartridge victorson game. So this is my notation for the least cost of a PLS protocol for a search problem, which is, we take it to be the monotone cartridge victorson game. Uh, again, the proof isn't terribly complicated. There's an easy and a slightly harder direction. I'm going to give you the easy direction since it kind of illustrates the definition. So again, I'm claiming that if I have um, a monotone circuit, I can define a PLS protocol that uh, solve this associated search problem. So again, I have a circuit and I fix an input X and Y to the uh, monotone KWK. So that means it's a yes input to the function and Y is a no input to the function. And the goal is to find this positive difference. So here's our circuit and given a fixed input, I can again kind of in my mind um, define a node to be feasible or highlighted in my picture if it has this positive difference property, the gate of value to two different values. And again, deciding this property for a node, <coughs> constantly many bits uh, are required. So I'm going to, to, to do two things um, in order to define this DAG on top of the circuit. If you are feasible, highlighted, you're going to point to one of your children which is highlighted, as in the um, formula case. If you're not feasible, 
then you're going to point to the root. OK, so, so if you're not feasible, then maybe your potential is a large number, infinity. You point to the root. If you were feasible, your potential is, let's say, the height of the node in the circuit. And you choose you know, one of the, the children to point to. So this way, you're going to describe this DAG whose feasible sinks are exactly, again, the, the variables that solve the monotone cartridge victorson game. So that's the kind of the whole construction, if you want. And the cost is just, well, I used a number of nodes, exactly the number of gates in the circuit. And each of these descriptions of where to point to what's my potential just takes constantly many bits to figure out. Okay. Questions about this? That's the, yeah. Why, do you, why can't you make those pies individual bits? Why can't you just replace each node with a protocol tree? Yeah, that's a good point. So there are, there are normal forms by which any PLS protocol can be made to have just a constantly many bits, maybe one or two. Um, it just gets hidden by the log without changing anything. Sorry? It just will get absorbed into the log. Yeah, so you kind of transfer the complexity over here to the number of nodes. If you bake protocols trees inside right, this picture. In fact, uh, this Rasperus theorem kind of says that there is a normal form because if you start with any protocol, you convert it to a circuit and back again, then, <laughs> then you get exactly constant cost for, for this. But that's con a convoluted way of seeing why that's true. Um, OK, so to me, like this kind of, I've been doing this for a few years, that when you have a communication model, you can always ask, it's a kind of difficult to prove lower bounds for, what's a simpler model, a query complexity model, uh, that kind of would be a simpler model for, for uh, questions about the communication complexity. So that's my knee-jerk reaction nowadays. You have a communication model, what's its analog in the query or decision tree world? So, you can, you can work this out, and it turns out that the query analog is this thing called resolution proof system. So, again, we have new students. I wonder how many of you have heard about the resolution proof system. Should I ask how many haven't? Does, can anybody? Okay, no, good. Sorry? You, you shouldn't ask the negative. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I come from Europe where people love logic and computer science, so I was taught resolution as an undergrad. But yeah, I'll, I'll review it uh, quickly. So resolution is the most uh, basic <coughs> propositional proof system to refute unsatisfiable CNF formulas. So take any CNF formula that's unsatisfiable, so under any truth assignment, so some clauses are violated. Um, you can hope to refute the formula, so kind of a certificate for its unsatisfiability, by starting out with the clauses of the variable, uh, of the formula, and then deriving new clauses from them. So um, all the nodes in my DAG here are now disjunctions of literals. And if I have two clauses, I can derive a third, as long as it's a logical implication of um, the two clauses. So there's a more syntactic way of saying this, which is called the resolution rule, and I think that's what gives this system its name. We have two, clau uh, two clauses where you have a particular variable in one clause and it's negation in the other clause. Then you can d derive a clause which is, well, the union of all the clauses except that one variable that was, had the positive uh, different signs in the two, two clauses. So you can apply this rule and it's turned out if you do this enough, at the end you can derive the empty clause, the contradictory clause. So that's a proof that you can't satisfy all of them because you know, they imply the contradictory clause. Um, so again, you can ask, given an unsatisfiable formula, what's the least size of such a, a proof of uh, unsatisfiability? Well, I mean, we've been known how to show lower bounds for this system since the 70s, I guess. It's widely studied. But again, I don't like it because it's a bottom-up description. You start with something and you end up... And it's even a kind of a negative phrasing because we don't like negatives, right? So, so you kind of work in this world which is... Um, you kind of assume that, okay, what if this guy had an assignment? 
then it would satisfy all the clauses and then the implicants and all the ways it would satisfy the contradictory clause, which is just false. So it's a proof by contradiction, indirect. So we don't like that. But luckily, there is a top-down description of this, uh, uh, this, um, uh, this object. So this was explored by Putlak uh, in the 90s, I think. And that's exactly going to be our, uh, this query notion of PLS. So with a formula, you can associate a search problem. OK, that's more algorithmic. We like that. Um, so the search problem is I give you a truth assignment <coughs> to the variables of the formula. And since it's unsatisfiable, some of the clauses are unsatisfied. And the goal in the search problem is to find one of the clauses. So you should think of this as a kind of a query complexity problem. Like how quickly can you find a clause if you can only make queries to the individual bits of the, uh, of the truth assignment? In fact, the decision tree complexity of this problem characterizes like tree-like resolution size, where the, instead of just an arbitrary DAG, you have a tree. But this work is all about DAG-like, like circuit-like complexity measures. So that's why you can capture your DAG-like resolution proofs by just defining this query complexity analog of PLS. So we call them PLS decision trees for solving this query search problem. And the definition is the exact same as in the previous slide, except instead, so you're again describing an implicitly uh, a, a DAG, but now the nodes are associated with, not with protocols, but with decision trees. So you just replace protocols in the definition with decision trees. So it's kind of canonical. Um, so each decision tree at a node outputs this su candidate successor and a potential. And I also modify the cost measure now. It's the maximum over all nodes of the, and how many bits of X you're querying. So, so one thing I like about this is it's conceptually so kind of straightforward. You don't have, there's no creativity. You just uh, have this classical Turing machine definition and you have canonical analogs in communication and query. So um, I can, again, kind of sketch why if you have a resolution proof now of what's the inter interesting measure here is actually not the size, but the width. So the width of a proof is just the maximum width of a clause it's using. Um, so you can, for any form, you can ask what's the least width of a resolution proof for it, and that's the resolution width. Well, it exactly captures this notion of PLS decision tree complexity of the associated search problem. And um, again, there's an easy and a hard direction. I can <laughs> sketch the easy direction. It's the same. You already saw it. You define a notion of feasibility. So last time we had for monotone Kashmir victors and games is positive difference. Now we're searching for an unsatisfied clause at the leaves. So let's just define a node to be feasible if the associated clause is not satisfied, so is falsified under the input assignment. Well, clearly the top contradictory clause is never uh, satisfied, so that's always feasible. And this was derived as a logical implication of these two clauses. So if this is false, it must be that one of its children are false under our current assignment. So you can always find a child and, and similarly kind of uh, define in exactly the same way a DAG on top of this. I only note that you know, what's the cost of testing this condition? So I can I have a query access to X. How, how many queries do I need to uh, determine this? Well, it's just the width of the clause, how many uh, variables are in the clause. So the, to test this and describe the DAG, its cost is just the, the, the width of the, the refutation. Okay, so I, I like how these kind of um, two models seem so different, monotone circuits, re resolution, refutations. Uh, I mean, of course, they're both DAGs, but why should they be related? Well, it's just that they are a query and communication pair of models. So what we showed in this uh, stock paper, so it's with the same people plus Ankit Gorg, who was a student here a few, days, a few years ago, is that you can relate the complexities in the query and communication world for some structured search problems. So the idea is that you can start with any search problem associated with 
an unsatisfiable CNF formula. So it's a kind of a query problem. You just have n bits of input. How do you define a two-party Alice Bob problem out of it? It's a principled way of doing it, which is to, comp to compose that problem with some smaller two-player function. We call it a gadget, <coughs> G. So here's your like, query problem. You have the n input bits. And you just plug in copies of some small two-party function. So um, for concrete, as we use this, it's kind of a widely used gadget where uh, it's called the index gadget. Alice gets a log m bit pointer. Bob holds an m bit binary string. And Alice kind of points to Bob's string and picks out uh, that value. So it just maps x and y to the x bit of y. That's a way of taking the query inputs and splitting them into uh, uh, Alice and a Bob part. For these kinds of composed search problems, we can show a characterization that the communication protocols are no powerful than decision trees, at, as long as you <laughs> kind of obfuscate the input bits by a two-party gadget. It's a long line of work on these types of theorems. I mean, we can prove it for, well, I guess Rand proved it first for deterministic protocols. We've proved it for randomized protocols. Now we have it for PLS protocols and decision trees. So this kind of, like, again, no creativity. You just look at the, the um, characterizations and they suggest a possible connection. Proving this is not terribly hard given this long line of work we have. In fact, the proof of this is two pages. If you take as a black box tools from these previous uh, query to communication lifting theorems. So this kind of completes the cycle. If we want to prove monotone circuit lower bounds, we start with a formula that's hard for resolution. So it has large, requires proofs of large width. Again, these kinds of lower bounds have improved, um, well, since the 70s, although resolution width, I think, was formulated only a bit later. But uh, nevertheless, these are considered rather easy to prove uh, lower bounds for resolution width. And, you know, there are hard, XOR formulas, systems of like ternary XOR constraints you can't efficiently refute. Well, you plug that in the machinery, you'd eventually like to get to XOR sat. And the only kind of missing link is how do you do the reduction from one of these uh, composed, you know, lifted problems? They're kind of artificial. How can you embed it naturally into a natural function like this? So, I mean, this was the Rasporov's characterization. So I think I'll spend a few minutes on this reduction. That's one of the new things in the paper. It's, uh, <laughs> the reduction is really slick. Now, I should have realized it years ago, but <coughs> you know, in, in hindsight, it's kind of very similar to what people have been doing in uh, the LP and STP extension complexity li literature. So, let's see. So let me sketch it through reduction. Uh, concretely for XOR sat. How can I embed these composed problems inside the monotone Karchman Victorson game of XOR sat? Okay, so let's recall this, um, this composed search problem. So I have some you know, XOR formula, four variables. Each edge is an XOR constraint. Well, it's a binary in this picture. It should be like ternary to really ha have hard formulas, but of simplicity, let's say binary constraints, the edges are constraints. So it's a fixed, unsatisfiable formula. Well, it's the associated search problem is I give you an assignment to the variables, find a violated edge. So then the compose problem means there for each variable I've given Bob an m bit string and Alice has this pointer into Bob's table. So um, here Alice would point to the second cell, which would mean that this variable gets the value in this cell, one. And so you have such a gadget for each of the variables of this formula. So, I want to, so they start out with this. Alice has pointers, there's binary strings. And I want to reduce it to a yes input and a no input to the monotone Karchman Victorson game of XOR sat. So in the XOR sat, I'm going to have not four variables, underlying variables, but four times m, the width of this. So all these cells will be the new variables. 
Well, it's very slick and simple. So Alice is just going to take this unsatisfied formula and embed it amongst these uh, new variables. So the first variable is just uh, mapped to where Alice pointed, similarly for the others. So it's just an isomorphic copy of the formula F. Well, F was unsatisfiable, so of course Alice ends up with an unsatisfiable formula. So it's a one input of X or Z. What Bob does then is he simply interprets his Y as a Boolean assignment to the new variables, so four times M variables, and adds to his instance all possible XOR constraints that are satisfied under this fixed Y. So you look at any pair, and there's possibly a XOR constraint there. You add it to your instance if this particular assignment satisfies the constraint. So <laughs> this is clearly a satisfiable instance because Y is one satisfying assignment by construction. So it is a zero input to XOR sat. And so that's the whole reduction. You have to check that somehow the solutions, the monotone Kochma Victorson game, they map back to the solutions of the composed search problem. And so, you know, you sit down for a minute and it's, it's automatic, but let me try to kind of spell it out. So, what's the solution to monotone Kochma Victorson game? It's an input bit that Alice has set to one, Bob had to set to zero. So that meant a constraint that Alice has, but, but Bob doesn't. So maybe one solution might be this edge. So Alice has this edge, but Bob doesn't have it. <laughs> so that means that by construction, uh, this constraint was not satisfied under Bob's Y. So, but that just translates back to, in our list problem, this not being satisfied under the assignment you get from uh, taking these pointers and looking up the values. Okay, so maybe that wasn't the most intuitive uh, uh, reduction ever, and that's maybe why I was you know, missing this picture for years, but now it's kind of really slick. Any, any questions about the reduction? So yeah, I mean, you don't have to use X or SAT. You can start with any unsatisfiable formula over some set of constraints, some finite set of constraints. Now run through this, and you get lower bounds for like the corresponding CSAT uh, uh, function, which is just a natural generalization of this X or SAT. And OK, you can use this to prove and uh, reprove maybe previous results, but really the only new interesting lower bounds are when you choose C to be a set of linear uh, constraints over some field. Okay, so that uh, our paper is actually in two parts. So we get these new lower bounds, and then the second part, which is about characterizations. I already told you about some characterizations of uh, formulas and circuits, but we have more. So maybe for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to sketch really briefly uh, that what we got out of um, this study. So I think, so one, again, like a knee-jerk reaction was this, this characterization of circuits via communication PLS. It's really nice, but people have been studying this TFNP subclasses uh, for a while in the Turing machine complexity setting. So why should be we just stuck with PLS? Well, you know, let's look at other classes and see whether we can maybe characterize other models of computation. So firstly, you can, you know, again, define uh, this mother <coughs> class, TFNP in communication complexity, as just, if in classical Turing machine complexity is the uh, class of total NP search problems, communication analog is all total two-party search problems that have an efficient non-deterministic protocol. So you can just define this communication analog. And an example of a uh, types of search problems in this class are exactly these monotone Gauss and Victorson games, because they admit very efficient non-determinacy protocols. So you just guess a coordinate, and then you test whether it has this monotone difference. It's like a log n bits of non-determinism. But actually, it turns out that <laughs> this is basically the complete example. <laughs> if you have any total two-party search problem, you can always reduce it efficiently to a monotone Karshman-Victorson game for some function who, 
whose number of variables is in dupe add. It's like exponential in the non-deterministic complexity. So the punchline is the study of the communication analog of TFNP is just a study of monotone cartman victorson games, maybe for partial functions. It's a small uh, technicality. So let me overwhelm you with all the TFNP classes that have been studied. No, I'm not expecting you to uh, <laughs> know many of this. Here's a class you probably don't know because we introduced it in this work. <laughs> but um, OK, so we saw PLS. This every DAG is a sync. It's communication analog captured circuits as Rasper's result. Kasma Victorson's result, you could say that the communication analog of, well, FB, like search problems officially solved by deterministic algorithms or in communication complexity, deterministic protocols. Well, Kasma Victorson says you can capture formula size, log of formula size using this. But yeah, there are so many other things, like what, what else can we do? And I thought, uh, people must have thought about this, it's such an obvious thing. So we thought about it, and finally we get one new characterization. There's a class called PPA for polynomial parity argument. And we can show an analogous result, that it captures something called um, span pr programs over GF2. It's a model of computation introduced by uh, <coughs> Karchmer and Victorson, actually. Um, so I'd, I don't know, I'd like to hear about models of computation you've thought about and whether you can put them on the map. There's, there's one class of circuits called uh, comparator circuits. So circuits composed only of comparator gates, gates that take two inputs, output two, in, two bits, and they just sort the input bits. So they don't change the Hamming weight. They are thought to lie between you know, the power of circuits and formulas, and we can put them you know, slightly in a better class but we don't think it's a characterization, it's just a better upper bound. So that's one thing you can do here, like more characterizations. Also, um, another thing you can do is try to separate these communication classes. So um, just as a warm up, Ron here was the first to show an exponential separation between monotone formula size and monotone circuit size. You can interpret that as separating communication analogs of PLS and FB. That's actually equivalent. If you want to separate two classes that capture models, it's equivalent to separating the monotone analogs of them. Turns out, not hard. But, well, Ron's result is much more powerful. It's kind of a query to communication lifting for deterministic protocols. So you can get much more out of it, not just a separation like this, but you plug in the best known query lower bounds. You can even improve this to separate, like an optimal separation, separating um, like deterministically solvable search problems from the <laughs> next level in the hierarchy. Other, other results you can interpret in this language is this Rasperov's lower bound for k-click. So uh, what's the monotone Karchman vectors in game for k-click? One player has the k-click, the other player has a graph not containing a k-click, and actually Rasperov proved it for even more structured instances. It's like you have a k-click, or let's say a k-subset of a universe of size n, and the other player has a k minus one coloring of the universe. And you need to find a monochromatic pair analysis set, so two nodes analysis sets that are colored the same in Bob's k minus one coloring. So k-subset, k minus one coloring. Why, why, what's the kind of combinatorial explanation for there being a, a pair of monochromatic vertices? It's the pigeonhole principle. So you can actually show that that problem is in the communication analog of this class PBP, which captures the pigeonhole principle. So his lower bound can be interpreted as a separation like this. Well, I mentioned this XOR sat function. You can view that as separating, well, XOR sat is actually complete for these um, monotone F2 span programs. So it's a function whose monotone Gartman Victorson game lies in this class but we showed it has large monotone circuit complexity. So that's our result interpreted in this language. We can actually push it a little further. So both of these separations can be improved to here. PPAD is some uh, directed version of parity argument. It famously captures the complexity of finding uh, Nash equilibria in the Turing machine setting. But you know, we, can, we can separate it from class capturing models and circuits just because we can plug query lower bounds into our framework and, and get 
It's a kind of an optimal lower bound for, for PLS out of it. Um, there are some lower bounds against monotone span programs from this other stock paper it's by Robert and others. Um, you can interpret them in this language, or we improve them a little bit. But that's almost all we know. So we just have lower bounds for um, monotone circuits and monotone span programs, but there are classes like this pigeonhole principle for which we don't have any lower bounds. I can just show by a counting argument that it's not all of DFNP. Like these protocols have a normal form and you can non-constructively show separations, but okay, that's not very enlightening. So we survey this landscape. This is kind of the best, you know, of the whole picture. Um, there are loads of separations that are not known. And this should be contrasted with the case in query complexity. So studied a few decades ago. Basically all the relationships, relative complexities of query complexity analogs are known. But in, in communication complexity, it's a lot harder to do this because, well, separating two classes might be equivalent to separating the monotone um, associated monotone models. It's a lot more difficult. So two things really. No more uh, characterizations, more separations, maybe more lifting theorems. I'm also interested in this problem of uh, exponential lower bounds for the perfect matching problem. So that's sort of connected with maybe the biggest open problem in semi-definite extension complexity. You'd like to show that the matching problem doesn't have efficient semi-definite extensions. So there are some <coughs> formal connections. I'm hoping progress for one problem might imply progress for, for another. But uh, yes, so I'll, I'll leave this here. Thank you. Time for some questions. So uh, you mentioned uh, you can do the same things that you did for 